Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, live webinar on societal resilience to black sky hazards. I'm very pleased to be here and see a lot of people logging in. Thank you very much for chiming in and letting us know where you're, where you're tuning in from. We appreciate you being here. Um, use the chat function throughout the webinar. We, we have about 400 registrants and looks like we're just uh, talked about 140 of people logging on. So I'm sure a few more will join. So because of the large numbers, we needed to um, have most of the participants participate through the chat. Um, but we will uh, be answering questions and taking suggestions from the chat box as we move through the program. And also uh, there will be a Q&A where some of those questions uh, may bubble up and have a discussion between our experts. Um, I'd like to, to thank uh, Professor Washington Ocheng and Imperial College for hosting us this morning. Um, I'm like, I'd like to now turn uh, the mic over to Professor Ocheng for uh, some opening remarks and then I'll walk us through um, the agenda for today. Uh, Professor Ocheng, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, please call me Washington. Um, uh, greetings, colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, to partake with you on this uh, very, very important topic. Um, a lot of people tell me that Imperial College London doesn't need uh, introduction, but I'll, I'll try to say a few words about our university. Uh, and just to share with you a couple of ideas about societal resilience and how critical and important it is to us uh, at Imperial uh, College London. So Imperial College London specializes in science, technology, business, and medicine. Uh, so we are very special in that respect in the sense that we do not uh, cover uh, most of the um, social sciences. So we are very much a tech science medicine and business uh, enterprise. Um, depending on which league table that you look at, Imperial College London is a firmly a top 10 university in the world. Uh, and one of the reasons we are is because we look at uh, resolving and solving global challenges. Um, we believe very firmly that that's why universities like us exist to try to improve the quality and the standard of living um, of the human race, uh, whether we are here underwater or indeed in space. So I'd like to try to test the technology by just putting up or sharing with you one slide. Um, and then I'll hand over back to Chris to uh, host the rest of the technical show before I come back during the Q&A. So let me try uh, sharing the screen. Um, so can, can you see my screen, please? Yes, Chris. sir, we see it fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so at Imperial College, by the way, um, I am uh, the head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And uh, before I started doing that, I was uh, the co-director of the Institute for Security Science and Technology, uh, which I'm still serving at present as uh, the Senior Security Science Fellow. Um, so the department and the institute, that is the ISST, uh, we've been deliberating about um, the various threats that we face as humans um, and been toying uh, with the idea of how to capture our threat vectors. Uh, so we ended up with this pentagonal shape here where you can see the natural bio dimension, the cyber, the physical, social and environmental and we were looking at one way of actually encapsulating all of that. And I came up with the concept of societal resilience, which obviously looks at the entire value chain of anything, including critical infrastructure. Uh, that chimes very, very well with uh, the work of the EIS Council. Uh, so we are natural collaborators, as we say it. And, and today is one of those events that um, obviously bring us together to try to move society towards uh, resilience, particularly with respect to um, critical natural infrastructure and focusing in, in some cases in uh, black sky events, which is obviously the topic for today. 
So as I say, I'm very delighted. And I say down there that research and development strategy needs to be underpinned by biosocial technical uh, concepts. Uh, and that means that, you know, it's got to go beyond engineers. It's got to go beyond scientists. We even need to look at human factors, behavioral issues. So everybody's welcome in trying to help get towards uh, societal resilience. Uh, so with those few remarks, um, I will stop sharing my screen and then hand over to Chris um, to host the rest of the, tech the next phase, which is the technical presentations. And then he will call me back in to look to lead on the uh, Q&A session. So back to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Washington. I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I think one of the things that EIS Council focuses on and, and, and stresses is the importance of cross-sector um, communication and planning. And so your, to your broader point of really needing all of those pillars of study from the engineering to the, to the social and, and, and otherwise, all, all are, need to be part of the solution. So I do agree that we are natural collaborators. I wanna quickly go through um, the, our agenda today. So we're, we're, first, we're gonna do a series of short presentations. These are, these are sort of very compressed versions of the basis of, uh, of what would be larger uh, classes, uh, but just to give a kind of overview and a sample of some of the subject areas that we at EIS Council and EIS Academy work on. Um, and then as, 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 uh, as Washington indicated, we'll, we'll have a Q&A and then followed up by some closing remarks. Um, so we'll start with uh, our CEO and Avi, uh, EIS Council's CEO, Avi Schnur, who will introduce this concept of the Metagrid and the global infrastructure interdependencies and why that's important for Black Sky events. Next, we'll hear from uh, our good friend, Dr. Paul Stockton about cyberspace infrastructure attack. And this is uh, always important, but no, no more so than, than, than these days in our current geopolitical climate. Um, I will then follow Paul, they have the unenvi unenviable task of following him uh, in speaking, um, but I will be talking about the electromagnetic black sky threats um, with a special emphasis on uh, high altitude EMP. Um, next will be our electric sector coordinator, Frank Koza, um, and we'll talk about the important interaction and necessity of having um, effective multi-sector communication in a black sky emergency. Following that, our, um, our dir director for infrastructure simulation, Dr. Anthony Bucci, uh, will talk about the challenges and opportunities in modeling the Metagrid um, and how it can help with decision-making. And finally, an important, uh, our, our exercise coordinator, Ranger Dorn, will talk about some of the exercises that we do, including black sky exercises and our uh, Earth X exercise. And these are really critical because uh, it's important to do have this as a tool as it allows lessons imagined rather than lessons learned, because as you're going to come to learn, if you don't know yet, that a black sky event is not something that we can probably recover from uh, completely. And so it's better to imagine what it would be like and, and drive preemptive uh, pre-event mitigation and planning, which is really the core mission of EIS Council. Uh, after, after those presentations, as Dr. As Professor O'Cheng said, we'll go into a, into a Q&A discussion uh, that he'll lead and I'll be happy to assist. Um, and then we'll have some, some follow-up remarks, uh, closing remarks from our CEO, again, Avi Schnur. So the opener, Avi, and the closer, Avi, um, is the uh, proud to be our CEO and the leader in systems engineering-based uh, black sky infrastructure resilience strategy he, uh, throughout the course of, of his career and, and especially in, in the uh, development of EIS Council. Um, he's been asked to brief uh, U.S. and international officials in the U.K. and uh, Israel, uh, NATO, on the emergence of these black sky threats. 
And so with that, I uh, turn it over to you, Avi. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, very much appreciated. And Washington, thank you so much for, for making this collaboration possible. Thanks to you and to your entire staff at Imperial College London. You know, it has certainly become obvious to us over the years that um, these societal resilience issues, societal risks, large scale risks are important not only to Imperial College London, but given its history to the United Kingdom, uh, we've certainly see that, seen that very recently. Uh, certainly Lord Arbuthnot's chairing of the House of Lords Select Committee on Risk Assessment and Planning recently, a very hard hitting report, I have to say, makes it clear that there is a sense in the United Kingdom that these kinds of issues must be faced. So, and thanks, let me say this at the beginning, thanks so much to all of you who are participating with us today. You know, this is not intended to be just another webinar. In fact, I would put it this way, I hope this will not be an interesting webinar. Exciting, motivating, energizing, above all leading to action, yes. But we are long past the time when simply informing ourselves about something interesting is relevant here. Certainly what we're seeing now with Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine and the consequences of that suggest that the future will definitely not resemble the past. Things will not be the same for many years to come. And that serves to highlight the concerns that Washington Professor Ho-Cheng, you mentioned in your remarks at the beginning. I think not just, of course, universities, but really all of us who work in this domain and really everyone has an obligation to do what they can because Chris, as you mentioned, black sky hazards. Um, what we're talking about here is complex catastrophes that without adequate tools and capabilities can have truly disastrous consequences for humanity. Um, so let me suggest, as you go through and listen today to what people have to say, what our panelists are going to be speaking about, please try to think and, and listen actively in the context of what you could personally do, how you could get involved. Because if everyone works in whatever way they can to help advance this, we can make the kind of progress that is needed. So let me then begin with a, an attempt to provide an overarching discussion of the problem. You know, we have welded ourselves as a civilization together, all of the different sectors, all of the different capabilities that enable us to survive and thrive and live and be entertained. Everything now is interlocked together into what has come to be called the metagrid, the integrated combination networks of networks of different capabilities and systems, many, many different corporations, government entities, everything mixed together at a level of integration that is almost organic. Now, the great thing about organic level integration is it leads to tremendous efficiencies and you know we, we see those, we use those every day. The downside of integration at that level, and we've only really been at this level, maybe, I don't know, five, 10, 20 years. The downside is if you pull any major organ out of an organic system, you risk the collapse of the whole thing. Now speaking in the organic metaphor, uh, when we look at ourselves as creatures, as organic entities, nature has a way of solving this problem. It's called evolution. And over thousands of generations, leaving many, many generations and individuals by the wayside, uh, evolution has managed to put together good, resilient immune systems. This is not a model that we want to follow. Um, if we want to survive, let's say when and if, 
there is a complex catastrophe, a black sky catastrophe, we need to work on putting in place the critical tools and capabilities for resilience ourselves. It's not easy, but people tend to think this is an extraordinarily complex subject. It's really not nearly as complex as it looks. And the work of, of uh, some of the leading academic institutions in the world, like Imperial College London, have helped to point the way here. This is, has been a focus of EIS Council for some years. It turns out that there is simply a handful of critical tools and capabilities which amount to gaps until they are widely deployed. I think it's really, it speaks well of the capabilities our civilization has managed to put in place. Most of what is needed is out there, but there is a finite number of gaps, let's call them black sky gaps, that require tools that are not yet widely deployed. It is essential, it is absolutely essential that we mutually, all of us together, find a way to start working on spreading, deploying these capabilities. And you'll get some examples today. The panelists are not going to be able to go through all of the gaps that, that we speak to in this category because there simply won't be time. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that um, the, the uh, material that each of our panelists will talk about really is just going to amount to the highlights in each area because that's what there's time for. But there will certainly be follow-up opportunities. I'm confident and, and looking forward to working with uh, you, Washington, with your team at Imperial College London to help uh, expand offerings that we might mutually work on. But just to summarize very briefly, what are, what are some of the most critical issues and gaps for which we will need to develop capabilities? Certainly, Chris, I think you spoke to the presentations we're going to see today. Dependable information, if decision makers don't have a compass to tell them which way to go, what path to follow, they're not going to know. This information can block them. Black sky protection, the work you're going to talk about, Chris, Dr. Beck, on EMP protection. You know, there is a double handful of critical black sky class hazards out there. EMP represents one of those that has really not seen an adequate focus in order to protect our most critical facilities. What is true? What is not true? What do we have to worry about? What don't we have to worry about? So, Chris, I know you'll be talking about that. One of the first casualties in any hazard, and certainly an extreme hazard on this scale, would be communication. Unfortunately, because without good communication, voice and data connecting all the critical decision makers in every sector, it's not going to be possible for us to work together to put everything back together. So how do you do that if communication goes down? So Frank Koza is going to speak to a, um, a very robust, really unlimited capability, uh, unlimited scalability system, an example of what you would need, which EIS Council is currently working on hosting. Deployment has already begun, although it's in its early stages. Uh, situational awareness. So it's true, decision makers, makers will need to know where to go, but it's not going to be adequate to just have a spray of facts in the vastly chaotic circumstances of a civilization scale event. What is going to be needed is some way to partition all of those facts to provide some help with decision support with an AI-based system. That's a challenge because techniques that have been used in the past to develop very large scale simulations have not thus far been successful. I think, Dr. Bucci, you will be talking about genome, a let's call it an elegant shortcutting technique that has the potential to get the job done by integrating all the relevant organizations. And finally, especially emergency managers know it's not enough to have good tools. 
you have good tools, but the people who need to use them are not well trained in them, you have a problem. And this is harder than usual because these are tools that once they're widely deployed can only be used effectively collaboratively. That means the training, the exercising has to be very multi-sector and international. <clears throat> Ranger Dorn, I'm looking forward to your comments about EarthX as an example of a very large scale multi-sector exercise on that scale. So again, let me just repeat what I started with. Thanks very much to Washington Imperial College, all of our presenters. Thanks to all of you. Please do try listening very actively as we go through today to think about what you can do. So thanks very much. Back to you, Chris. Well, thanks so much, Avi. It certainly set the table, uh, gave us a great overview and expressed the urgency of the topics we're going to be covering today. So now we're gonna get into the meat of some of those specific topics. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Paul Stockton. Thanks, Paul, for being with you, with us. And Paul's going to be talking about um, attacks in cyberspace and disinformation. Paul, it's always a timely topic, but never more so than today. So we're really happy to have you here, uh, and we'll we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Chris and Professor Ocheng. Let me tell you uh, from an outsider looking in perspective how remarkable it is that you've built the program that you have. The integration of these different disciplines, uh, obviously in many universities that would constitute an unnatural act, something that professors uh, don't automatically do. And it's, it's absolutely terrific and very timely that you've been able to uh, create this a synthesis of different academic disciplines in order to focus on strengthening societal resilience. And that's the topic of my little presentation today, societal resilience against information warfare, and also especially combined information uh, cyber attacks. And I'd like to talk with cyber, about cyber threats to critical infrastructure, just to lead things off. There's intensive analysis, no doubt in your institution and the ones in which I've served, uh, on how China or Russia will conduct cyber attacks against uh, critical infrastructure. But we also need to ask the question, why will they conduct such attacks? Why will they expose themselves to the risk of response operations by the UK or the United States? Why will they roll the dice? I believe that they're going to attack our critical infrastructure in order to accomplish their political goals, just as Clausewitz uh, would have argued. And here I'd like to uh, read a little bit from the U.S. counterintelligence strategy that I think illuminates what we're up against in, in uh, addressing the why question, why would attacks occur? Adversaries are developing the capability to degrade critical infrastructure, and their efforts are likely aimed at influencing or coercing U.S. decision makers in a time of crisis by holding critical infrastructure at risk of disruption. That is, they're going to threaten to hold our public health and safety at risk by either threatening or conducting cyber attacks against water systems, electric systems, other infrastructure essential uh, for public health and safety, and uh, convince us that unless we back down, we will suffer uh, unacceptable costs. And I'd say the same is true uh, for the United Kingdom and other NATO partners of the United States. They'll face the same potential risk of a threat from Russia or China saying, unless you back down in this crisis, we're going to inflict pain on your population that you'll find unacceptable. And I think the prime use case for the United States in backing down in a regional crisis is uh, a Russian attack on NATO. And clearly, as uh, Chris and Avi have referenced uh, before, uh, we're all focused on the horrific uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the infliction of uh, civilian casualties, and of course, <laughs> loss of critical infrastructure uh, and water service uh, across many Ukrainian cities. Uh, but I think, of course, things can always be worse, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Putin. And I'd like to focus on what it would be like if the current conflict were to escalate 
into Russian attacks on NATO and its partners, including potentially via cyber attacks on the UK and the United States. Again, as I mentioned before, adversaries will use information operations combined with uh, cyber attacks to demonstrate their ability to inflict pain, but then use information operations in order to uh, convey the kind of messaging that's designed to incite fear and a uh, panic. And obviously this has deep historical roots. Uh, some of us have read about Lord Ha Ha's uh, efforts during World War II in order to incite fear and panic among the uh, London populace. Uh, during the Blitz, and that is magnify the psychological effects of devastation from the air by using radio waves. Well, that didn't work very effectively. And in fact, there is uh, historical evidence, as you know, that uh, Londoners were able to rally around the flag uh, and that uh, these efforts by uh, Nazi Germany were actually counterproductive in terms of corroding a British morale. I'd like to discuss that if we have time during the Q&A. The difference, of course, now is that social media may provide much more effective means of manipulating public perceptions. And of course, Russia and China are adept at doing so, at micro-targeting information operations, as they did against the US electorate in 2000. 16 and 18. And with the advent of artificial intelligence, of course, now they're able potentially to ramp up micro-targeted social media messaging at scale in ways that we've never historically experienced. And I think above all, I'd say we are facing a risk of exemplary attacks. That is limited cyber attacks on targets in the UK or the United States paired with information operations designed to magnify the psychological effects of those limited attacks, and above all, threaten that further nationwide punishment will follow unless the leadership of the UK, the United States, and other uh, NATO allies back down from the crisis that, that we're facing. So what is it gonna take to uh, defeat these coercive operations? Uh, information operations and paired with uh, cyber attacks. Well, first of all, I think we need to uh, be ready to suppress attacks at their origins abroad. And some of you may know that according to press accounts, the United States military uh, disrupted the operations of Russian servers managed by the Internet Research uh, Agency just prior to 2018 elections. I think attack suppression has got to be part of the equation. And I'd welcome a chance to uh, discuss further how NATO partners might prepare for such operations. But we also, of course, need to play defense at home. And looking at the uh, mission of the Imperial College, build societal resilience against information operations and combined information cyber attacks. That has a lot of dimensions. I think there's long-term opportunities to educate the UK and American publics to be more discerning consumers of information that uh, is conveyed to us uh, by uh, China and Russia. But I think we also need to have deeper cooperation with the social media platforms that are gonna provide the means for conveying this information. And we need to start thinking about what effective counter messaging would look like. How can the prime minister, how can the president speak to their people and try to uh, explain why the costs of uh, uh, coalition operations are, uh, are worth it? And to do so in a contested information operations where many Americans don't believe President Biden is the president. So thinking about what we say and how we say it, I think is part of the societal resilience puzzle that I'm hopeful we can continue to support uh, your institution, Professor O'Chang, as we go forward. With that, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to support you today. And I look forward to the Q&A and then uh, collaborating uh, in the months and years to come. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I, I agree that we want to get to this in the in the Q&A and all this kind of transition by saying that uh, 
one element that I'll be talking about, the electromagnetic black sky threats are related in there that they're sometimes talked about as brute force or dumb cyber attacks because they affect computers and other uh, electronics. So with that, I'll, I'll, I want to I want to start uh, with an overview of the electromagnetic black sky threats. Um, but quickly, uh, who am I? Uh, Dr. Chris Beck, I'm uh, the chief scientist and vice president for policy at EAS Council. Um, I have a, I'm a physicist by training and uh, after academia spent uh, about a, a decade on the Hill as a science advisor and then joined the council in 2011. Um, for today, I want to talk, I'll give a brief overview of the electromagnetic black sky threats. There are three of them. And then due to uh, the situation, geopolitical situation we find ourselves in, uh, I'll, I want to give a little fo more focus on high altitude electromagnetic pulses or hemp. So the, all three of them are the, uh, the electromagnetic black sky threats are hemp, as I mentioned, um, intentional electromagnetic interference or IEMI and geomagnetic disturbances, which are, which are naturally occurring phenomena um, caused by coronal mass ejections from the sun. And there are similarities and differences. Um, and I think framing things, talking first about the high altitude EMP and then mentioning the other ones uh, is important to just for a basic understanding. So first of all, uh, this, all of these phenomena do not harm uh, people directly. So it, it, the, the principal out, output of any of these is, is radio waves. Um, and uh, we all have radio waves passing through us right now. So there isn't a direct physical impact on people, but to varying degrees, they affect electronics and electromagnetic equipment. So the high altitude electromagnetic pulse is the most complicated. And it has three phases. One is very short, lasting from a nanosecond to a microsecond. And then that, that first phase is called E1. And E1 is the, is the part of a, uh, of a high altitude EMP that would affect electronics. Then there is a slower phase, uh, E2, that is microseconds to a, little, a tenth of a second, say, uh, called E2. And that is not, it doesn't look exactly like, like like lightning, but it has a similar profile electromagnetically. And that's the one area where because uh, it is similar to lightning and we have extensive use of protecting equipment that with, from, with lightning suppression uh, that we feel is, is already kind of inherently protected against E2. And finally, E3 is a slow pulse and that is caused by distortions in the Earth's geomagnetic field uh, due to the high altitude EMP. Um, this is a uh, seconds to a few minutes phenomenon. And this does not affect electronics like radios or anything small, uh, but rather very large structures with long cables. The, the biggest concern of course is the electric transmission system, but long uh, cables, uh, long uh, uh, gas pipelines, all of those can carry currents that are driven by um, the E3. Now, uh, just to touch on the other two, intentional electromagnetic interference looks a lot like E1 in that it's, it's, it's high frequency and can affect electronics. The differences are important. It, it can, when you have a hemp pulse, it's one pulse and it's over in a microsecond. With IEMI, you can keep pulsing. You can do a continuous train of pulses. So the, an IEMI attack could last longer, but a key difference is that it's a very short range phenomenon. So within a kilometer or so. Um, geomagnetic disturbances on the other hand are like that E3 pulse, very low frequency quasi DC that only run through these very long conductors that does not affect electronics. So as I mentioned, uh, because of uh, Mr. Putin's war, as, as Avi put it, has explicitly put the use of nuclear weapons on the table, I wanted to focus on hemp today. Um, as uh, Michael Cohen uh, 
wrote in the chat, but EMP has a very large footprint. Um, you can see here, it depends basically on the line of sight of a weapon detonated at altitude. So even in that smallest circle in the center, we're talking about 720,000 square miles that would be illuminated by an EMP pulse. And for a comparison for our friends in the UK, that is about 94,000 square miles. So um, well within a very even low altitude and low yield um, EMP burst. So you have kind of instantaneous effects over a large area. Um, the also sort of relevant is that the biggest data set we have of an EMP burst over land was conducted in 1962 by the Soviet Union. The US also did a test in 1962, but it was over the ocean. It did affect things in Hawaii, which was 800 miles away. Um, uh, the, they, they were not as dramatic though as the effects that were right under the burst that one might imagine. Um, so there was lots of damage shown to overhead lines, even buried cables, uh, all kinds of electronics. And this was 1950s and 60s era technology, which is much more robust against uh, high currents than today's semiconductor based microelectronics. Um, and also the one thing that makes EMP um, a possible weapon that is easy to use is it's, it doesn't have to be very accurate. Um, it, as we've shown, you, you don't have to get much altitude if you can get the warhead up uh, 50 kilometers or more, um, it will have an impact and it doesn't have to be accurate. It bursts at, at altitude and then covers a large area in its impact. So what happens, at, the phenomenology is interesting, but um, what we we have a we have a burst. There's a lot of complicated things that happen with uh, Compton electrons being uh, scattered by gamma rays and so on. But when we get to this ground layer, what we really end up with in the end is radio frequency energy that radiates down and impacts critical infrastructure. And we sort of on the left hand side showing what we would say is a is the direct or radiative component, whereas that that radio wave actually hits a radio or a computer bank or something like that. And on the right, we're demonstrating that there's also the quote conductive threat, which means that long cables like power cables, communications cables, ethernet cables, things like that, pick up this RF energy, just like an antenna would. And we find that in fact, when those, that concentrates the energy more so, uh, things like microelectronics have a lot harder time dealing with conductive threats than radiative threats. Um, it's an active area of research and EIS Council has been proud to partner with the government and private sector. Uh, this was the first and to my knowledge only full scale uh, electromagnetic susceptibility test of a functional uh, gas fired combined cycle electric generation facility. And we did find there that there's lots of communications cables that are in there that do act as the antenna. And so that conductive threat is something that needs to be dealt with in generation stations. The good news is that EMP protection is straightforward. It basically is, is, is shielding and filtering um, what is called a Faraday cage uh, around sensitive equipment. There are some technical specifications of how you need to do that correctly, but it is actually uh, compared to cyber, a much more straightforward thing to protect against because the threat doesn't really evolve radio waves or radio waves. Um, in the conducted threat, uh, neat options are again, sort of a Faraday cage around the wire, which is shown at the bottom middle, um, but also you can change to non-conductive wire and fiber optic, or you can do a wireless solution. So there are solutions available and we just need to make EMP uh, awareness and protection something that we build into our engineering practices. So I thank you very much. Um, I, uh, looking forward to the discussion and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause now and turn it over to my colleague, Frank Coza to talk about um, Emergency Black Sky Communications. Frank.
Yes, Chris, thanks very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone on communications. Um, first, a word about myself. Uh, I've spent a number of years in the electric utility industry. And in the presentation today, we're going to talk about a solution in the electric industry. But um, most, most recently, as Chris mentioned, I'm the electric sector coordinator at EIS Council. That gives me the privilege of working not only with electric utilities, but many of the other critical infrastructure owners and operators. And we talk about communications. I think we can all agree that communications is very critical to the operations of each of the critical infrastructures and particularly in the energy sector um, because of its impact on all the other critical infrastructure that's very important that the electric industry have communication solutions that will be able to be deployed if we ever get in a situation of a black sky event. So it's important that we have the communications to keep things going or to recover the electric, electric um, infrastructure as we pr proceed here. Now, I wanna to mention to you, this does get pretty complicated and we're gonna talk about primarily electric industry today, but um, to be able to provide communications across the uh, critical infrastructures is a real challenge. And like I say, as we thought about this, we figured we've got to start with the electric industry, but ultimately our goal is to provide a solution here that will knit all the critical infrastructures together. Now, this is what this is a black sky event. This is a satellite photograph image of the Northeast blackout in the US of August, 2003. Uh, obviously, this was a significant blackout, outaged a whole lot of customers in a very highly populated area of the United States and also parts of Canada. So this is the kind of event that we want to have a communication system to be able to help us restore and recover the electric power system in this kind of an event. Uh, in these kinds of events, the electric industry relies on a process called Black Start. Black start is the process of selecting particular electric generators, generally small, marrying them up with areas of load or demand in a balanced network to create balanced islands. That's what we're trying to depict here with the red circles. In order to bring the electrical system back, we've got to be able to communicate between the predetermined black sky generators and the loads. Generally speaking, the loads and the generators are not at the same physical location. So you, you quite frankly have to have at least uh, voice communications between your generators and your loads as you bring them up in a balanced fashion. As the islands are created, um, they can then be connected together and that kind of brings the electric system back. So that's, that's the challenge with uh, electrical system restoration in a black sky situation. As we thought about this, there are a number of features that the system has to have. We thought it needs to be based on the utility uh, fiber backbone, and we think utility control is important. Uh, as Paul mentioned, the threats re relative to, to cybersecurity, uh, jamming, things of that nature, we've got to have security and firewalling to make sure that it will survive. And then we also have to have the equipment that is EMP protected at a minimum to be able to make the whole thing work. That led us to the company named Raphael. Raphael is a Israel-based defense electronics firm. Uh, Raphael has developed EMP protected radios that have significant cap capabilities to help us get through these kind of black sky situations. So we've partnered with Raphael uh, uh, to develop these kinds of equipment to, to help us put the system together. Now, you might ask, so why do we think it needs to be fiber? Well, you just heard Chris talk about uh, the importance of having, I'll say, non-metallic kind of conductors so that the EMP does not become a factor. So uh, we're thinking it's fiber because it's inherently uh, EMP protected. And for the most part, we found out that utilities have deployed uh, fiber assets across the electric transmission system. Why do we think it needs to be utility controlled? First of all, the utilities have made significant investment 
uh, into fiber assets. We think it just makes complete sense to utilize that existing asset to be the backbone for, the, for this communication system. Um, anecdotally, utilities have told us that in a situation where they have significant outages, utilities do not necessarily have priority with the traditional telecom provider. So uh, we think another important aspect of this is utility control. So then the utilities basically are at the top of their own priority list and getting repairs made if they're necessary. Uh, the way we've chosen to implement this, we've, we've done a couple of small pilot projects. Uh, the first one was in 2019, where we used uh, some of the equipment, we used some of the fiber network, uh, particularly utility uh, in the PJM area to, to provide at least a test of this capability. And then our second pilot, which is in progress right now is a much more significant effort. And in this pilot, we're connecting uh, several utilities together using their existing fiber assets, in this case, Dominion, Exelon, and PJM. Um, we've established a utility-owned fiber network between and among those three, and we're in the process of, of completing that, and we'll be testing that uh, shortly and to prove out the interconnect connectivity of, of the system to make sure that we have multiple uh, aspects or multiple entities to be able to connect on utility fiber assets, and they can interconnect with the various uh, communications assets that they have at their uh, on their particular system. So that's what we hope to finish up very shortly and prove out the system. Our goal from there is to expand the network. We found that there are a number of people, number of entities, number of utilities across North America that have fiber assets in place. Once we've been able, able to prove the equipment that we have is works and the concept works, we just hope to explain or hope to expand that uh, network across uh, not only the United States, but hopefully North America to provide that kind of capability that Avi talked about that will help us get through these kind of black sky events and basically spur on the ability to, to do re resource, uh, to do the electric system uh, recovery and restoration. So that's what we're working on. We hope to expand the network and provide that capability that we think is so very important. So Chris, thanks very much. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Frank. Um, one of the key tools of uh, communication and um, that leads us right into our next presenter, Dr. Anthony Bucci, um, who is basically looking at even a broader picture than that of what are all the entities that will need to communicate in this meta grid and how do they interact with each other. So I recognize you, uh, Anthony, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me just share my slides real quick. Can everybody see my slides okay? Yes, sir. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming uh, today. Um, yes, as Chris mentioned, I'm going to take a bit of a, a step back. So, um, you know, Chris talked about the uh, some of the physics of the black sky hazards, and Frank talked a, a bit about the communications uh, requirements. I'm sort of taking a step back and talking about simulations and and why we would want such a thing. Um, so, just a, a bit about my background here. Um, uh, basically, I'm I'm. Um, I come from a background in mathematics and computer science. Um, however, all through my career, I've had kind of a deep and long running interest in complex dynamical systems. So systems with many inter interconnected parts that have sort of non-trivial behavior because of the inter interconnectivity. Um, I joined uh, EIS Council about a year and a half ago, I suppose, and I've been overseeing the, um, the development of <clears throat> the, um, the genome system that I'll talk briefly about towards the end. Um, but to sort of frame the problem, and I guess we've already seen this uh, a bit, but just to frame it from the perspective of the simulation, um, you know, we're in a state now, and, and just looking back the last couple of years, um, we've seen in the United States alone, let alone worldwide, um, these quote unquote once in a century events um, and catastrophes. And we're talking about flooding and freezing and, um, you know, wildfires, uh, global pandemic, things that, at least according to the stats, are supposed to be fairly uncommon, and yet they're becoming more and more common. Um, on top of that, we've seen quite a rise in 
um, the frequency and severity of cyber attacks and especially ransomware makes the news quite a lot. But um, behind the scenes, there's also exfiltration attacks that steal sensitive data from government and corporate uh, entities and so on. And together, these are revealing um, deep and kind of frightening vulnerabilities in um, our lifeline infrastructure. So just a, a quick survey that I, I grabbed from, from websites, there's the, the uh, wildfires, wildfire season in 2021, which was just very bad in, in North America. Uh, the hurricane season, same year, very, very bad. Um, again, we had the pandemic all going on at the same time. These, these would be bad enough on their own, but they're all going on at the same time. Um, and then this is a list of ransomware attacks just from August 2021. And it's without going into great depth, that's just a long list. <laughs> so the list should be empty, and yet there it is uh, very frighteningly long. Um, there was an event in the United States where a hacker attempted to uh, poison drinking water. Luckily, that was thwarted. Um, and then probably have heard of the Colonial Pipeline uh, hack as well. So those are all um, man-made. And then recently, in the last uh, month, um, we've seen a, an aggressive invasion of Ukraine by the uh, the Russian president, and that has put on the table the, the threat of um, EMP attacks and potentially other uh, types of attacks. So to sum it all up, you know, not to not to be frightening about it, but the, the, the worry about black sky events where, you know, very large scale collapse of the electric grid um, is not an abstract question. It's, it's a very real uh, possibility. So when we talk about trying to secure our infrastructure and, and the meta grid, as, as Avi's coined it, um, against this sort of increasing rate of problems and, and calamities, you know, what do we do? How do we approach that? And obviously, there are lots of different ways. Um, but I would say that one of the first steps is identifying what exactly is being secured. What, what are we talking about when we're talking about securing something? And <clears throat> You know, it it's almost goes without saying that since situational awareness is very important, you know, understanding the state of each of the things um, that you're attempting to secure. But what we're talking about is the entire infrastructure metagrid, not just one facility or one region, but the entirety of it. And the reason for that um, is that collectively together, you know, as Avi mentioned in his opening, um, our critical infrastructure has been knit together so tightly that um, it resembles an organism. And I just have here on this slide a quote from the Santa Fe Institute for Complex Systems, which is a, a wonderful um, source of information on complex dynamical systems if you're interested in, in those. Um, you know, it includes among <clears throat> a list of, of complex systems, cities and economic uh, systems, civilizations, but also the nervous system and, and, and uh, cells, right? So um, basically summing that up, our infrastructure I, I argue is best viewed as a complex system similar to an organism. And just as you can't pull organs out of an organism without causing um, great distress to the entirety of it, uh, likewise, we can't tolerate um, the degradation of one of our lifeline infrastructures without potentially catastrophic effects on the rest of them. They're all interconnected. Um, and unfortunately, this poses a big problem because um, you know human beings are just not great at understanding complex systems with the unaided mind. There are effects like nonlinearity and randomness, the collective dynamics of multiple uh, interacting parts, this phenomenon known as emergence. Um, they really just don't, don't fare well. Um, the, the, the techniques that are typically used to study systems don't fare well when these phenomena are in place. And neither do our brains. Uh, we, as people, just don't have a great ability to stare at a complex system and understand it in the way we could understand, you know, uh, an object sitting on a table, for example. Um, and I, you know, perhaps that's not so surprising. We're also not very good at seeing Neptune with our unaided eye. We use telescopes for that. Uh, we can't see the coronavirus uh, just staring at, at a slide. We need a microscope. Um, so very similar to that, we need an instrument to help us understand uh, complex systems and all their um, complexity, <laughs> um, but you know, not with the unaided brain, but with, with, a, with a tool. Uh, and so this is sort of the punchline. Um, you know, simulations are that tool, or at least one of the tools. You know, analogous to a telescope or a microscope, a simulation, and, and I would say particularly uh, agent-based simulations in this case, um, are the analogs of, of telescopes and microscopes, but for complex systems. And they are what allow us to develop 
situational awareness, particularly in um, the midst of a, of a restoration process, which can be very complicated and, and scary. So just to kind of bring the point home a little bit, at EAS Council, we have been working on just such a thing. You know, we believe that this is a, a gap that exists and it's a necessary uh, step to fill that gap. So we've been working on a tool that we call Genome, and it's a large-scale multi-sector um, metagrid simulation. We also call it an operating system because we are adding to it the ability to plug other uh, simulations into it. So we don't develop all of them ourselves. It's more like Microsoft Windows gives the facility for all these other pieces of software to exist and run within it uh, without, without Microsoft writing them into itself. And so here's just a list of some of the um, sort of apps that our operating our simulation operating system supports currently. They have various levels of maturity, but um, that's what we have. We're working on the fidelity of these and you know making increasing their realism and also adding uh, new ones. Um, so here's just a quick screenshot. Um, I'm running a bit low on time, so I'm going to speed a bit. But it's a running piece of software, so you can pan and zoom this map. The the indicators are showing different infrastructure entities being simulated, and there are informational displays that, that tell you uh, facts of the simulation as it runs. So that's um, <clears throat> that's a genome in, in a picture. And then just to wrap up here, um, you know, genome really allows you to integrate uh, different simulations and work that have already been done well beyond what a single person could do on their own. And then as an instrument, it gives you situational awareness to complex systems. And then as a paradigm, we feel it's a, an important new approach to um, deal with the threats that we face today. And with that, I apologize, I went a bit over time, but I'll turn it back to Chris. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, excellent discussion of a tool that will help try to, as you pointed out, like bridge this gap of, of understanding of all of these complex interactions uh, that we need to deal with in the Metagrid. Um, next, we are pleased to be joined by Ranger Dorn, who will talk about another tool, um, exercises that allow us to imagine the worst case without actually experiencing it. So Ranger, the floor is yours, sir. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Yes, sir, looks great. Excellent. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, Black Sky exercises. Uh, we understand what the hazards are, we know about them, but have we really asked ourselves much about our preparedness? And that's what I'm going to be covering today. Uh, a little bit about myself. Okay. I'm sorry, but my slides are not progressing the way I was planning. All right. So uh, my background is in fire protection administration from the engineering department at Cal State Los Angeles. Uh, worked in the public sector, got a, a master's in public administration. But the uh, uh, part that really prepared me uh, to be involved in exercises was becoming a master exercise practitioner, uh, working with uh, uh, FEMA, being trained in that. And then incident management experience. I've been to a number of hurricanes. I've been to earthquakes. I've been to other large events and seeing things happen in real life and the uh, interactions that uh, folks have uh, had as we uh, go through managing these incidents. Uh, and uh, I've done a lot of training and exercise development uh, specifically for electric utilities, water utilities, and also public and private organizations, uh, all the way up to uh, assisting states with uh, national level exercises. Uh, in the last five years, I've been an exercise uh, coordinator for the uh, EIS Council, and that has uh, brought me uh, to the point where I've been uh, involved in development and implementation of exercise. The first thing we do is we have an audience-focused uh, approach. So we take a look at who our sectors are. Uh, currently, we uh, interact with uh, uh, 38 different sectors in our exercises. We take a look at what the impacts are to those folks. We have a number of focus groups. We have a number of subject matter experts we involve as we develop out what's going to happen in an exercise. So uh, first off is the audience focus. We also help prepare folks. We have prevent workshops where we will talk about the uh, black sky hazard that we've chosen for that uh, year's EarthX or black sky exercise. 
We want to make sure that there's as much information in front of folks as possible. We offer a lot of facilitation support, both uh, written and in webinar format. So when folks uh, choose to do uh, one of our exercises themselves, they are in a position to run it. And our focus is resilience building. It's, it's one thing just to uh, throw an exercise and pat each other on the back. That, that's not what we really want to do. Uh, we want to take people from that comfort zone of, hey, we just had an exercise and uh, yeah, we succeeded again. We're awesome. Take them into that fear zone and past it and get them to the point where they actually learn something. We do that by building a scenario. And in that scenario, we paint a picture. And uh, now I'm going to paint that picture for you. This morning, people across the United States and around the globe found this on their computer screens. And I'm not this hearing thing is sound, to look more serious uh, than although just I carry sound over, so attack. are you hearing uh, sound? Intermittent power outages across yep, most sounds of the fine, regions Ranger. of US, Perfect. Europe, Asia. There've been sporadic outages at communications networks, cell phone service, spotty in many areas. To give you a sense of how this event is affecting major cities, this natural gas drying plant's control systems were attacked, causing the facility to cease operations. In powerless districts, a number of traffic signals went out. Signals with functional battery backup had also failed by the time the fire began. This morning, people across the United States. So what we've done here is we painted a picture with our scenario. We want folks to take themselves out of their regular uh, everyday uh, job take a look at where they're at and actually uh, ask themselves, uh, what does this mean to me? What does it mean to my supply chain? And uh, if they even know this, what does it mean to my supply chain supply chain? So we're asking folks to develop their situational awareness. And once they have that, we take them into a next step, which is risk assessment, asking themselves, what does this actually mean to us? We can be aware of something, but does it really make a difference to us? And if it does, do we need to make some decisions? We take them through that process, we provide some tools, and we insert cascading consequences because anybody who's been through a disaster realizes that it isn't just one thing. Uh, one of the tools that we use, we called it the Monte Carlo, for lack of a better name, but we had close to a thousand injects in last year's exercise. And we insert these in kind of a random uh, feature or random fashion. So not everybody plays the exact same exercise, but these are focused at cascading consequences to one of those 38 lanes. And as you're playing, you get something that becomes very real to you. Uh, when we do our exercise, we ask people to actually have real discussions. Take a look at your plans, challenge your assumptions, think through some courses of action. What would you actually do? We're not asking people to sit there and just, just watch the exercise. We want them to participate. We want them to assess what happens when we pick an action and we get some more consequences. We want you to uh, end up at the end of one of our exercises really asking the, the question, would we do that again or do we need to change? We have them do that in a hot wash, which is an immediate uh, uh, kind of review at the end of the exercise. We also ask people to do an after action. We want them to go ahead and have a solid uh, process for really taking a look at change. And change happens in incremental fashion. I, I've been at it enough years to see that it just doesn't happen overnight. One drop at a time fills the bucket. So we take feedback from the folks. We take a look at resilience levels, preparedness. Uh, we provide guidance and we look for gaps. And what we've seen is in resilience and preparedness, there are personal gaps out there. People have done a little bit in some places. Some have done more. But I would say overall, if you really look at it, uh, preparedness on the personal side is probably pretty low. If you told people that the store was closed and they couldn't get food or they can't get water, they're not ready for that. If you take a look at the public sector, and this is where it's, it's even scarier, uh, a lot of organizations indicated they were not prepared or ready, and they are not in a position to go ahead and take care of things. Uh, that is a, a very scary situation. Some even said they would reach out to other organizations for help rather than do the preparedness themselves. That's not a good place to be. And finally, the private sector, that uh, area where we depend on food, and our groceries, our fuel, our money, everything else, you would expect a very high level of preparedness towards the black sky hazards and we have identified gaps there as well. So how do we get there? What's next? Well, once you've identified a gap, you actually have to do something. We're looking for people to take actions. 
And we want organizations to do that. We want them to think about who do we depend on, who also needs to be involved if we are going to be effective out there. And I would say that integrated approach, the cross-sector approach is important. And then the final thing is assigning roles and tasks. It's one thing to identify a problem. It's another thing to actually do something about it. And with that, I will conclude and thank you all for uh, being here today. Thank you so much, Ranger. I um, appreciate everyone um, from the EIS faculty's presentations. I invite now, uh, we've, we've gotten to the, to the Q&A. Uh, we'll have about a 20 minute discussion um, with, I, I'd invite all the uh, EIS faculty and uh, also Washington to uh, open our cameras and our videos. And um, I'll, I will turn it over to um, Washington to begin the discussion. So thank you very much, Chris, and thank you to all our presenters and speakers this afternoon. I have suddenly learned a lot. Um, so can I, can I use the prerogative of the chair to ask a, a couple of general questions? Um, Chris, please help me track the um, questions of the chat. And I, let, me, let me thank Avi, because Avi has been very active in responding to comments on the chat. Thanks very much, Avi, for, for doing that. Um, my, my, yeah, my question is to Avi and Paul, actually. Um, two questions. The first one is with respect to Black Sky events. I mean, these are potentially catastrophic, some of them. Um, and the duty of governments is to protect and secure its people. Uh, and that must include uh, basic infrastructure services. How much involvement uh, in the United States, um, in the UK and the rest of the world are governments involved or not in this crucial, crucial thing, which is a, a real fabric of society of any country? Um, I can offer the following thought, Washington. Uh, I think the concern is growing in both the public and the private sector. And the role that governments could take ideally would be to take a look at putting in place policies that directly address these risks, both in terms of regulatory policy impact and also encouraging investment by, by uh, private sector. I think there is in some cases now a growing investment largely looking at uh, public sector investment, government investment in private sector hosted projects, which can be helpful. But I think it's fair to say that this is a domain that could be critical and it needs to increase. But from everything we've seen, I think the fastest and most likely way to see progress move forward is to see encouragement from governments and then early deep engagement on the basis of leaders in the private sector. The government, government agencies are likely to follow uh, rather than lead when it comes to detail effort. So Paul, how do we, how do we actualize? How do we get them involved? Because we, I, I have this problem, I have to say in the United Kingdom in, in trying to, first of all, convince government from the perspective of risk. I mean, there is, there is no zero and one, as you know, with risk. And if you're going with very low percentile risks, 10 minus seven, eight, people are asking, is it even worth considering? So how do you sell this to government? And how do you actually get them to actually participate and provide the resources to develop tools like genome, ethics, and so on? Well, uh, for Zhou Cheng, let me uh, start by admitting I'm part of the problem. I had the honor of serving as President Obama's Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense. Right. I was one of those SOBs who didn't provide adequate resources and wasn't sufficiently uh, far uh, sighted to understand emerging problems. It's, it's, it's inherently difficult uh, for government uh, to uh, account for these problems. And moreover, I would argue that the role of the private sector is always going to be of preeminent importance in this realm with government in support. First of all, 
uh, infrastructure owners and operators. They have primary responsibility for the security of their systems against all hazards, including all of the ones we've been discussing today. Uh, we have a situation where in the information realm, of course, the role of social media and the uh, owners of social media platforms who make money off of conveying the most inflammatory, panic-inducing uh, clickbait. Uh, we, we've got a challenge here, and I want to congratulate you and the European Union for uh, being a little more forward-leading on this than the U.S. government has been. There's big problems here, but uh, it's imperative to make progress. What can government do? Well, there are some uh, funding opportunities, but I would say intelligence support of the sort that does not yet exist to critical infrastructure owners and operators. We're just nibbling away at that in the United States. Washington, I'm wondering if maybe there's a more progress in the UK to make sure that actionable intelligence is in the hands of the folks who run uh, power and water systems in London and beyond. And then secondly, we haven't talked about it today, but I'd invite your thoughts, deterrence. That is the realm of government. We ought to be able to threaten China and Russia with punishment, including in the information realm, that they would genuinely fear in order to discourage them from launching attacks on the United States. How would we do that, given the growth of the Chinese Great Firewall and the Russian now equivalent in the context of Ukraine? And even if we could break through the firewalls, uh, Professor Ocheng, what would we say that could possibly be convincing to the nomenclatura, the general public, everybody else whom we'd like to uh, persuade to uh, uh, that they ought to fear our information operations. Over to you. Yeah, I, I, I um, remember, I think you said it, Paul, you talked about false flags. Uh, we call them false alerts or false alarms in the, in the UK. And, and uh, you know, um, obviously, obviously, doing it in fact attacking and obviously with the terrible consequences we don't want but but how do you see the false flags the false alerts and the potential for the, that kind of disruption i mean how real is that i believe it is real and uh we're at risk of that vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh chemical warfare now uh, by russia in support of its invasion of ukraine but i believe that that's a lesser concern Professor Ocheng, I think if we're uh, really in an edge of war situation with China or Russia, we're going to know the origin of information and cyber attacks. They're going to be out to get us. They're going to try to eat our lunch. And so I think problems of attribution and false flag are going to be relatively limited. The question is, for you at Imperial College, how do we build societal resilience against those information operations and combined attacks to come? And how can we message our own people in a way that, let's face it, maybe not everybody is going to believe what Boris Johnson has to say. Just being candid for a moment here, how can messaging in the UK by the government convince the UK population that they really ought to stand up for their NATO allies, no matter what the costs? Excellent. Thanks very much, Paul. Chris. Any burning question on the chat? I see something from Kenneth about spending one to one point two billion dollars or something. Sure. Well, I I, I was going to say I, I could uh, I could probably listen to a discussion between uh, between Washington and Paul uh, for the rest of the time, but we'll try to <laughs> we'll try to move on and pick up some other questions. Um, so one of the things is as the as the EMP guy and kind of pivoting from, from Paul's um, uh, discussion is often trying to figure out um, sort of relative complexity of the two uh, often get asked between EMP and cyber, um, which is harder to deal with. And actually, technically, it's much harder to deal with cyber uh, than EMP. EMP is, is, a, is a fairly straightforward phenomenon. Um, it, it can be handled by radiological shielding, we understand radio waves, we know shielding and grounding. Um, and once you've done that, uh, it is done. Um, you, you, I mean, maintenance aside, uh, there, there isn't going to be a new kind of radio wave thought up 
that can get around metal. But with a cyber attack, you have the you know evolving, uh, evolving threat, evolving pathways. So it's a much it's a much harder or it, it, it takes continued uh, upgrades and so on to to keep ahead of uh, advanced persistent threat. Um, and there's always going to be new disinformation out there as well. So um, it, it's it's just something that we want to get the the information out that it it can be kind of readily protected. Um, it's it's just that it's not very well known and not not a thing that that typically um, engineers think about. Yeah, th thanks, Paul. Um, th there is a, a comment and question in one from Rob Murray uh, from NATO, um, saying, building on my first question, relative to 10, 15, 20 years ago, do we think that the private sector is far more prevalent in this area uh, as opposed to as opposed to governments. So any response on the, any member of the panel on that one? I, I think, why don't you want to take that one, Avi? You know, I, I think we have seen leaders in the private sector stepping forward much more than in the past to deal with, with a variety of black sky hazards. I think the focus on cyber is definitely there. There is, there's the beginnings, I think, of investment in EMP protection that we did not see 10 years ago with some leaders in, in the United States focusing on this. I'm not sure of the status in the United Kingdom. I think uh, there may actually be some, some advantages that the US private sector power companies have in terms of being forward leaning. I think the same is true in Israel. I think uh, some of the key utilities in Israel have been very, very forward leaning. Uh, the EU broadly, uh, there is important work that's been done in Scandinavia, but uh, I, I, an enormous amount still needs to be done. Thank you. So, so Rob follows that by, Rob Murray follows that by, if, it becomes clear to the society, the citizens, that you know responsibility for this kind of thing now rests with the private sector, as opposed to the government. How do you think that would be taken societally? I think that's for you, Paul. So, so the idea that you know um, protecting critical natural infrastructure of this sort to, from black sky events is a responsibility of the private sector as opposed to government. It is a puzzle because we're used at, to, as, as you said, Professor, at the outset, having government protect us. Uh, that is so bygone, that assumption. We're right. now seeing uh, citizens and the private sector directly targeted, and they have responsibility, as I said before, uh, for their own resilience, including citizens on the street. And I think rethinking the uh, ro relative role of uh, a government strategy for security versus having a whole of nation strategy. Everybody in the United Kingdom being responsible to shape strategy and implement it effectively and get it resourced. I think that's, if I could, a part of the challenge that Imperial College is facing in advancing societal resilience. Old, let's call it Westphalian understandings of the role of government in uh, and being preeminent in national defense. I think that's a past era now. Yeah. Very good. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we, we got some questions, um, which are, I think, in the Paul and Avi's territory. So we'll come back to you. But I, I do have a question to ask um, Anthony and, and Frank, and also uh, Ranger, for, from the perspective of models um, that we create, let's say, to represent what is to be protected. So I do agree with Anthony that um, you've got to understand what you're trying to protect, otherwise you're onto a loser, I think. Um, so can you comment please in turn on modeling fidelity and validity? Um, how, how do you deal with that? Because these are fairly catastrophic but rare events, thankfully, I hope. How do you deal with fidelity and validity of such tools or, or models that are encapsulated in such tools? So maybe Anthony first. Yeah, I mean, 
the the question is is an important one, and I think it's it's kind of a general question of any modeling effort. Um, it's definitely um, it has more real world consequences in this case. But anytime you create a model, you're immediately faced with the question of whether it's valid and to what extent. Um, so you know, I think that there are a number of techniques that can be applied uh, to that. You know, things like sensitivity analysis. Um, you know, I've I've probably in my career built 30 of these kind of agent-based models. And um, what you almost always find is a lot of the, the, the entities that are engaging in the, the simulation don't really affect the outcome uh, very strongly. There's certain key, they're similar to bottlenecks. There are certain key events or certain key individuals that have a very large effect uh, on the ultimate outcome. And those are the ones that you can focus your attention on the fidelity problem uh, there, uh, and maybe you know allied a little bit the other one. So, like in genome, for instance, we have a, a traffic simulation that simulates cars driving around a, a city during some event, and whether we're simulating three hundred thousand cars or three hundred twenty-seven one hundred thirty-three cars doesn't matter much. It doesn't really affect the big picture of what's happening, um, but which electric generators are coming back online and when does right? So. Um, you know, I think that the techniques like sensitivity analysis and various kinds of Monte Carlo simulation where you vary parameters and see, does the outcome remain robust? The outcome of the model, like what it's predicting or what it's telling you, uh, remain robust with respect to the, the randomness. Um, I think those are important uh, to, to use. And then as far as validity, I mean, I think there's a broader question here of, of that, that leads into acceptability. So you can build a model that, that could be a perfect view of the world that, that you need it to be, but if nobody accepts it as true, then it's it is worthless as not having one. So there's also a kind of outreach question. Can you work together with the people who would actually rely on this model uh, to do something real? Uh, can you work with them to get them to the point where they're confident in what it's saying, uh, what it's telling them? And that's as much a question of the user interface and the bug fixing as it is the model itself, right? It, it gets into a bigger question of software development and deployment and acceptance. So yeah, I guess I, I haven't answered your question. I've simply said it's a very good one. <laughs> but I think, you know, there are sort of it's tried and true good. practices in model building and software deployment that I think play just as important a role in this as any other uh, technology uh, endeavor. Thanks very much, Anthony. Fran? One thing we really haven't talked about is when you go to the private sector and you say to them, you have to protect everything, that's when you lose people. Um, it's important that we very carefully select our highest priority locations, facilities, systems to be able to apply these technologies to. If you can do that successfully, then I think you can get the private sector to buy in. And I guess Avi talked about uh, leaders in the electric utility industry, we have examples of people who, in our minds, have um, figured out the, the highest priority facilities to start with, and they're taking action. I think that's what we want to encourage. And once you have some successes, you can build upon those successes and expand. But if, as soon as you say to uh, uh, a critical infrastructure owner and operator, you've got to protect everything, then it becomes overwhelming and you kind of lose them. So I think that's the thing we've got to keep in mind. Very good. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Ranger, please. Yeah, I'd like to suggest that we are in the start of year three of a worldwide exercise and looking at it as how we've approached it. I think every nation has a different approach. Uh, every state in the United States has a different approach. And even every county in California where I live has a different approach to how we're dealing with the COVID exercise, as it were. Uh, had this been a much worse uh, uh, event, I think uh, we've shown that we're really uh, not aligned as we should be towards a, a common approach or a common effort out there. In our exercises, I think, uh, I think one thing that validates what we've done is each one of our scenarios, except for uh, EMP, has happened. Uh, when we had uh, cyber, our uh, cyber exercise very closely mirrored solar winds before it happened. 
uh, that was kind of a surprise. So the news validates what we've done. The same things happen with our uh, regional fire and flood uh, exercise scenarios. Uh, we're watching that around the world right now. Uh, those things uh, do happen. So I think we've picked good targets. Uh, I'm hoping that our EMP exercise does not also happen, but we can't uh, bury our heads in the sand uh, and hope that it won't. So I think we've taken a, a realistic uh, look at the world as we uh, create these and uh, create the impacts. We, we do a, a wide look at the different sectors and we do uh, bring in uh, public and private sector, uh, both in our work groups and in our exercise. And I think that's important to uh, make sure that we're not just focused uh, one direction. I've, I've seen a number of exercises in the public sector that uh, really don't uh, involve the public that well and really don't challenge that well. Uh, they are uh, regional at best, uh, back padding, even though the national exercises uh, you would hope have more of a national uh, approach, but uh, they don't. I think uh, EarthX is probably the only worldwide exercise that we do uh, uh, that I have seen. There may be others out there, but uh, I'd like to uh, think that we're uh, opening uh, new ground there. Thanks very much, Ranger. Um, uh, Chris, any burning question on the chart, please? In the chat? There is well, one here. There is there is one here. What of please, the vulnerability please. of religiously induced attacks from the likes of Iran, and and so on? Religious, religiously, religious induced attacks, a religion based attacks. Um, I I might try an answer for that. Uh, look, the approach that we've taken at ICE Council for black sky hazards is we are completely hazard agnostic. And I think we're also evil megalomaniac agnostic. Um, whatever, whatever the reasons that some crazy, let me explicitly call them evil person would have for launching an event that could really bring down civilization, I think it's essential, no matter where it comes from, that we simply accept and credit the fact that, as, as you were saying earlier, Washington, um, our level of interconnectivity in the world is unprecedented. And what that means is we have to be prepared to deal with anything that could bring down our interconnected, interdependent world. That's different than it's ever been in history. I mean, we've seen civilizations rise and fall over and over again, but there has never before been a civilization that is tightly interconnected across all sectors and the entire world. And what that implies is that we have a far higher level of responsibility as organizations in academia, in the private sector, and as individuals, if we're going to collectively beat the evolutionary paradigm and get this done. It's very interesting. Uh, one of the questions is talking about economics um, and effectively a cost benefit analysis type question. Um, I, I remember when I was involved with uh, looking at GNSS, in particular GPS, and, and what that would actually do to the UK if there was disruption, um, an outage over one week, which is five working days. And we estimated that at five billion pounds. Um, the question is, what about the economic impacts of resilience? Is it affordable? If not, how do we make it affordable? Avi. You, you know, it's interesting. We have, we have come down to both the tools and capabilities we talked about today and a few more. Five different areas of absolutely critical tools and capabilities that are needed if our society collectively wants to be capable of dealing with these black sky events. They typically are not that expensive to implement. Nevertheless, at the micro level, in the private sector world, even small economic pressures make a difference. And I would say this, there tends to be very often an attitude of money is bad, economic pressures should not have to be there. But I would like to turn that around. I would say if something matters, economics is the way as a society we value services. 
let's find a way to incentivize the private sector to make the kinds of investments that are needed here. Even very tiny incentivization changes, I think, could pay enormous dividends in helping advocates for this kind of resilience move forward in their, in their uh, private sector world. Chris, how are we doing your time? Um, I think we're at the bottom of the hour, and uh, I, I know I noticed that some folks are needing to log off. We always want to be respectful of everybody's time. So if it's okay with you, um, Washington, I think we probably need to move in to wrap up at this point. But okay. it, it's, of course, a, a topic we, we would love to discuss for hours and hours, uh, yeah. which we will do uh, sometime soon, uh, we hope. Let me, let me ask my last question question then uh, because uh, this this is a burning question it's for Anthony actually um, so you mentioned complexity um, I've always argued that one of the reasons we are in some of the trouble we're in now is because of focus so when we normally write proposals for funding reviewers come back to us saying this is an unfocused proposal and the, and therefore we're not funding it but when you think about hyper complexity and its multivariate nature um, it's very hard to say, you know, I'm focused on modeling this super hyper complex system. Uh, how do we get funding uh, agencies, funding authorities to begin to look at, you know, things that humans naturally tend to be averse to, as you put it, uh, in terms of hyper complexity and things like that? Yes, uh, it's funny you say that because we just had a proposal rejected with a very similar comment about being unfocused. So. <laughs> a, a collaborative one that we were in. Um, so it, yeah, it's a common problem. And, you know, I wish I had uh, a great answer to that, but I'm struggling with it myself and have been for, for many years. Um, the, the, the path to success that I've found works most often is to sideline the model a little bit and talk more about what it's going to do, like what it's going to achieve, and then make the modeling, tell the story that the modeling is necessary to bring about that outcome um, so, but, but I mean, that's, that's really not a silver bullet. That's not going to work with every proposal. Um, you know, I, I, I think institutes like the Santa Fe Institute in the United States spend a lot of energy attempting to raise awareness about these kind of phenomena and why they're so important and necessary to focus attention on. Um, I don't think that government funding agencies have followed suit uh, nearly as quickly as, as we would like. Um, for sure, but I do think there is some progress in, in that realm. Um, the EU, the you know the the European Union, at least at least in their funding call, seems open to the idea of talking directly about the complexity of a situation and potentially funding uh, efforts to to um, address it dire directly. But um, yeah, I think again, I haven't answered your question. I apologize, but <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, one, it's one of those questions for us going forward. Obviously, collaborating. Yeah, it's yeah, important. Before, yeah, before I hand over back to Chris, uh, from my side, from Imperial College London, I'd just like to register our sincere gratitude and thanks to all of you uh, um, for uh, the great presentations. As I said, I've suddenly learned a lot. Also to all attending the webinar today from all over the world, we've had excellent attendance. And last but not least, just to say thank you to the organization team uh, led by Avi from the other side, Udi, uh, would have been great to see you, Woody. Uh, we've worked with very closely with Woody, and um, most most importantly, Lehi for uh, organizing everything with Jack from our side, Hayin from our side, Andrea, and so on. So thanks to all of you, and and we really look forward to uh, continuing and developing our collaboration going forward. So with that, back to Chris uh, for the wrap up session. Okay, thank you so much, and, and um, our, our great thanks to you, your team of Jack and Hayen, and uh, I echo your, um, your, your praise for Udi and Leahy for getting us started, and Leahy for making the trains run on time on this, uh, so, th and, and thanks to the whole faculty for your, your thoughtful presentations. Um, as I said, it's, we could talk about this for hours, and I'm glad in a way that, that Washington, you ended us up on sort of an open question because that's going to be um, next steps uh, in our uh, collaborative relationship. So I really appreciate that. Um, so just a few notes. Uh, we've had a fantastic discussion. <clears throat> um, 
I wanted to talk about a, a, a alert folks to a few upcoming events. Um, every every other month, uh, as part of our um, Global Resilience Commission webinar series, uh, we have a we have a webinar um, somewhat similar to this, but usually a little uh, uh, tighter in scope. Um, and the next one we'll talk about, we'll expand and, and dig into some of the points that, that Frank was making on emergency communications during a blackout specifically. Um, if the EMP discussion was of interest and um, hopefully uh, it was, uh, we have published a handbook that we're very proud of on practical effective remediation for EMP. Um, it's mostly focused at the electric utility sector, but it, it is applicable to others. It is, it is available on Amazon, uh, so you can look for that. Um, we also would want everyone with great attendance today and great questions, and this is the kind of energy that we like to see and that we usually get during our webinars, um, input from folks, and we want to hear from you. We want you to be part of our team and inform us with your interesting observations, knowledge, and questions. Um, so if you navigate to eiscouncil.org, you can become a member. And that uh, ePro handbook that I just talked about uh, that's for sale on Amazon uh, is yours for free if you become a member, at least for the time being. Um, we, we invite you to, uh, if you enjoyed this and know folks that would also be interested, please let other people know. So share, share us with your network. and. Um, finally, um, we've provided, and, and you'll have um, follow-up information, emails for our team, um, and so on. There's a, a, a message box on our website, so please, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Avi Schnur for uh, closing remarks and thank everyone uh, on the call for your participation today. Avi, thank you, back Chris. to you. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Washington. Thanks to the organizing team. And again, as I said at the beginning, thanks to everyone who's participating. Uh, the future really does not resemble the past when it comes to the rapidly changing high-tech civilization that is keeping us alive. The only way we're going to be prepared to deal with the rather, frankly, terrifying hazards, these black sky catastrophes that, that are now being worried about is if everyone at whatever level you can engage, everyone gets involved. So right now, keep yourself informed, uh, become a member of EIS Council. Your organization, either a government, public or private sector organization, whatever it is, um, certainly talk to your colleagues if there is any potential to encourage your organization to engage with us or engage with some other entity out there that is focusing on in an action-oriented way in helping to prepare for black sky events. This is all about individual action because no one is going to get high credit for this uh, in whatever sector they work in, the, the credit that you'll get will come from watching the resilience of society gradually increase, watching your colleagues begin teaching the, taking this seriously until we have a groundswell of opinion out there that says, hey, we care about the future. We care about giving our children and our grandchildren a world in which they will have the kinds of opportunities that we have. So I've seen in the chat, there are so many people who are taking this seriously, who have been extremely active listeners. Thank you so much to all of you. And Chris, um, I th thanks so much to you for, for being a superb moderator. I appreciate that. Thanks, thanks again, everyone. Um, Fantastic session. I'll close it and we will look forward to hearing from you from uh, having follow up discussions and um, hope to see you all very soon. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.